Hey, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. We're going to talk about pediatric shock. Now, we do have another video on adult shock, but there are some differences that are important enough to do this separate video. Pathophysiology. I know you're thinking, I thought we were finished with this, but I'm bringing it back. We're going to talk about this because it's important to the mechanism of shock, and it's going to have a big factor on how we treat it. So what do these equations mean, and do we have to memorize them? Uh, I think you can probably figure them out. The DO2 stands for delivery of oxygen. CO, we've seen before, is cardiac output. Uh, CaO2 is uh, the uh, content of arterial oxygen. So this equation says that the amount of oxygen delivered to the body is equal to the amount of cardiac output times the amount of oxygen in the blood. So that's a pretty common sense equation. And then we add it together with uh, cardiac output equals stroke volume times the heart rate. So how much in each, in each stroke and how many strokes per minute. So the reason I share this with you is because a uh, change in any of these factors can lead to shock or can lead to decrease of cardiac or of delivery of oxygen which is the major cause of shock so um, that means if we decrease the amount of uh, volume in each stroke then we're going to uh, decrease delivery of oxygen as long as no other factors are compensating so any of these things can can lead to shock and hypotension we often associate with shock and by definition, shock in adults is characterized by hypotension. But in neonates, we don't have to have hypotension to, character, to call it shock. And uh, that's because the uh, baby circulation uh, works a little bit differently, and they basically will sacrifice a lot of uh, other things in order to keep blood pressure up. So, um, so they ba they compensate a lot and if they be and if the demand or if the amount of um the lack of oxygen it becomes too much that they can't compensate that's when you get ischemia so and then ischemia or inadequate perfusion is what uh, leads to a lack of energy in the cells which means you can't keep the pumps going on the cell membrane which means you get toxic substances out in the circulation and um, you start to damage the uh, damage the cells and damage the tissue so the causes are, are usually broken up into three categories I've got four here and I'll tell you why in a second hypovolemic shock is uh, anything that causes a uh, low volume of blood. So anything that causes uh, dehydration, uh, like diarrhea or not getting enough uh, water, um, bleeding, thermal injury, and diuretics all can cause a, a decrease in volume, which means we have less blood to get the oxygen around to the body. Cardiogenic shock just means that the pump isn't working good enough to get the blood to the body. Uh, some examples I've got here are depressed myocardial activity for whatever reason, congenital heart defects, arrhythmias, volume overload, diastolic dysfunction, bilateral pneumothoraces, and cardiac tamponade are just some examples of some that are more common in infants. So... Uh, distributive shock is the third category, and usually septic shock is going to be included in distributive shock. At least today, that's the way it's usually characterized. Classically, we've called distributive shock um, a different category, and, and also we've called it neurogenic shock. But uh, the way that we categorize it mostly today is distributive shock is the types of shock where um, blood is, um, is leaking outside of the vasculature. And um, that could be caused by uh, um, 
An inflammatory pro process like anaphylaxis or septic shock can also be caused by uh, autonomic, uh, autonomic dysregulation. So the spinal cord damage, epidural anesthesia, and adrenal insufficiency. So, and then uh, septic shock we're familiar with. There's toxic shock syndromes are, are the big ones, but there's also uh, basically any other infection can, can end up leading to shock. So hypovolemic shock is the most common type of shock that's seen in infants. And the presentation of all of these dis different forms of shock usually includes these cool extremities, poor capillary refill, skin tinting, um, and even dry mucous membranes, but that's probably going to be more associated with hypovolemic shock. So again, this is any anything that uh, involves just a lack of volume. That means we don't have enough blood to get oxygen around. Cardiogenic shock it's just when our pump is failing and you're going to see more lethargy, poor feeding. Tachycardia is one that's, that's going to be associated with most of these. Um, tachypnea or tachypnea, rails, JVD, hepatomegaly are all some signs of cardiogenic shock. Now distributive shock. I've got neurogenic shock in, in parentheses here. I think this is still kind of a little bit of an evolving definition. But uh, they say neurogenic shock is associated with hypotension without tachycardia. But other types of distributive shock, including anaphylaxis and uh, sepsis, you do, see, um, you do see tachycardia still. So... Uh, that's still a little bit of a, a gray area, but maybe neurogenic shock should be its own category. I don't know. So here's septic shock broken up into two big categories. There's the cold shock. This we see most common in children and warm shock that we see more in adults. And the big difference here is just um, whether or not we've got blood uh, to the periphery. Um, so low cardiac output in cold shock and high uh, systemic vascular resistance. And warm shock has high cardiac output and low systemic vascular resistance. So uh, this means that in the cold shock, we're tightening down the blood vessels and we don't have a lot of blood out in the periphery. And in the warm shock, we... Uh, we've lost autonomic tone in a lot of these, and so the vessels are dilated. We do have a bunch of blood kind of pooled out in the periphery. I don't know how important those the mechanisms are to remember, but I think the big thing is that cold shock, the skin is cold. The uh, skin is generally it has a mottled appearance. Uh, there's slow capillary refill, diminished pulses. In warm shock, there is a uh, higher cardiac output. There's uh, plethora, uh, meaning the skin looks red. The extremities are warm. If you push on the capillaries, they fill immediately, and th you can feel the pulses are bounding. So um, children can go back and forth from this. They can go back from back and forth from cold shock to warm shock, and I don't know why, but the the major, the classical uh, appearance of this is that children present in cold shock and adults present in warm shock. So the complications, we could do easily uh, a lot of videos just dedicated to the complications of, of ischemia, but think about the big organs that need blood right now. So the heart obviously needs blood because it's going to get blood to everywhere else. You don't get enough blood to the heart, it shuts down, and that's associated with acidosis and then damage to the rest of the organs. Not enough blood in the lungs um, it can lead to um, a respiratory distress syndrome and uh, you know basically a respiratory failure. Not enough blood in the brains causes all kinds of neurological deficits. 
kidneys, kidney failure, liver, liver failure. These are all complications of decompensated shock. And they're all reasons why we need to treat quickly. So this is a this is a life saving situation here. It's a life or death situation. So the first things we're gonna think about are ABCs. Airway and breathing, we kind of combine those here. We we give oxygen in most cases, and in a lot of cases, we're going to intubate early, even if the patient um, is uh, is still you know awake and uh, alert. We might want to consider intubation, but certainly if they have altered mental status um, and can't protect their airway, or if you uh, if it appears that respiratory failure is is imminent. But other reasons that we might do it early is just to decrease the metabolic demands associated with respiration. We also can help regulate temperature this way uh, to administer sedation. It helps to be intubated. And uh, positive pressure uh, on uh, the ventilator decreases afterload. So then we move on to circulation. We need to get uh, vascular access really quickly here. Uh, two large bore IV lines, uh, usually in anacubital fossa bilaterally. Or um, in brand new babies, you can do the umbilical venous catheter or uh, intraosseous needle. So uh, complications with getting large bore IV lines into these kids is, of course, they... A lot of them don't have very much uh, blood to uh, they, their uh, vessels are, are collapsed, so it's hard to get those lines in. That's why we might end up doing the umbilical venous catheter or the intraosseous needle. So I've got here treat first, ask ask questions later. Uh, this is obviously not a good motto for medicine in general, but in in here uh, in septic shock we're going to start treating the shock before we figure out why it's there because that's the thing that's going to kill them right away. So to talking about diagnosis, we have these uh, uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome criteria for babies as well, and they're pretty similar to the adult ones, but they're just kind of uh, age-specific because uh, there's a just different numbers that we're working with, so we're not going to pin it down to numbers as, as much as we do in adults. So the temperature, for example, can be a little bit higher in babies. Uh, for the heart rate, you compare it to uh, the normal and as well as uh, respiratory rate, the normal for the age. And then, of course, the leukocyte count. So the mnemonic we did before was um, S for speed, so you can say that that's for the speed of the heart rate. I for inflammation, that's your inflammatory cells, your leukocytes. Um, R for, uh, I think this was for red hot, um, I think. <laughs> uh, and that stands for the temperature. Um, and then S again for speed, uh, the respiratory rate. So we also do want to figure out what's causing this because we need to treat the underlying cause. Uh, but we're going to stabilize the patient first or at least be in process of stabilizing before we uh, start taking our history. Um, we do um, blood cultures, urine cultures, lumbar puncture in case it is a septic so cause. And we'll figure out what's causing the, what's causing the shock. So treatment of septic shock is uh, a little bit controversial, it seems, because uh, I looked at two up-to-date articles with two different regimens, and then uh, Stanford, which, which is usually my go-to for antibiotics, had a different regimen. So in neonates, um, amoxicillin plus gentamicin, um, was what it said on up to date. Uh, I think Sa Stanford said amoxicillin plus cefotaxime. And then in neonates, if you think there might be an MS, um, uh, MRSA, 
and you can add vancomycin or if you uh, think you've got a viral cause you can add the acyclovir too over 28 days uh, you go straight to vancomycin plus cefotaxime and if uh, if you think there might be some kind of a GI cause you do clindamycin or metro metronidazole and in immunosuppressed patients uh, vancomycin plus cefepime make sure you co cover uh, pseudomonas so uh, thanks to uh, somebody who calls themselves premeditated chaos for our shock diagram if you want to help out, um, please comment below, share the video with other people, um, and go to worldmedicalschool.org and volunteer. There are lots of things that we, we need help with, like design, editing, uh, submission of practice questions, that type of thing. So please uh, go on to worldmedicalschool.org and backslash volunteer. Thanks.